I was lying in a lake of blood. Beside me floated my beloved daughter, Isabel. She reached for me and our fingers intertwined. Above us a cold, heartless moon, surrounded by indifferent stars, shined down, silvering our skin. Father, she whispered, Father, look at me. I did as she bid, a smile on my face, so happy to be in her presence once again. I had a terrible dream, I told her, taking in the glory of her face. I dreamt that you were dead. I am dead, she said sadly. Can't you see? Suddenly, her face began to rot, and she started to scream, her fang mouth opening impossibly wide, eating up her face in a red ruin, the hands shot from beneath her, tearing chunks out of her writhing body. No, I screamed, but she was gone, dragged under the red depths. Now hands also began to grab at me, spinning me around, dragging me under the blood-red surface. There were hundreds of them. Thousands, and I realized those poor lost souls were my own victims brought back to some sort of terrible life, eager to exact a righteous retribution. I tried to pull away, but the hands were persistent, calling my name. Nicholas, wake up. The voice was a female, and familiar, echoing through my head. Struggling, I opened my eyes and breathed in cold, filthy water. Above me, the face of a woman bloated, shining like the moon from my dreams through the murk and gloom. Bambat. She smiled at me then, a look of sadness in her eyes. Time to be up in the world again, Nicholas Raddock. How? I pushed my thoughts into her mind. How can it be? You are dead, my love, and I am dreaming once again. A dream within a dream, she answered, pulling me towards the surface. I tried to fight her, wanting to be alone in my sorrow, but she was strong. My mother in darkness. She always had been so much stronger than I, and now she tightened her grip as we broke the surface, rising us higher and higher until we levitated above the water. How? I said, reaching for her face. How are you real? But she said nothing. She moved in a blur of motion, depositing us on the nearby shore, where I shot to my feet, embracing her and kissing her face. She endured this patiently before gently pushing me away. We must talk, Nicholas. The Vampire Council is looking for you and have declared you an outlaw for the murder of Jeanette. I care nothing for their banishment. My joy at her presence was fading now, replaced by a smoldering anger. I thought you long dead. I have mourned your passing for a hundred years. I found your letter and your sun blackened clothes. I ran my hand through your ashes, pulled them to my face, wept over them, and yet here you are, very much alive and well. How did you do it, Papa? Why did you do it? Or have you risen like some terrible phoenix from your own ashes? Am I terrible to you, then? She said, reaching for me, but I backed away. Explain first. She sighed, then and sat down upon a nearby rock. I did it for you, Nicholas. I was making you weak. Your love for me made you vulnerable, and you had your family... At some point, you would have had to decide between your mortal descendants and myself. A choice that would have torn you apart, and so I made the decision for you. And is that the only reason? I asked. Knowing there was more. No. She said. I was jealous of your devotion to them. I considered hurting them, killing them. But I knew you would never forgive such an atrocity. I was confused and angry, so I decided to leave. 
But I knew you would follow and try to bring me back to help you watch over these children of your lineage, and so I faked my own death and left you. My family, I sighed, are all dead. It was nothing more than my love for them that inevitably brought about their end. No, Nicholas, she said, drawing closer, compassion heavy in her eyes. You must not blame yourself. It was the council that brought about their destruction. They are envious and cruel. That is why I left the council all those years ago. They live only to serve themselves. They care nothing for the rest of vampire kind. Do you think they cared for one second about the mortal lives lost to your ravenous son? No, do not fool yourself, my Nicholas. They only cared about themselves being exposed. For if the humans began to believe in us once again, then who do you think would be the first to go? And now, with the killing of Jeanette... You have challenged their power and authority, and for that, my beloved, they will see you dead. Not if I kill them first, I growl. Nicholas, she sighed, you are like a child screaming into the wind. Jeanette was the least of them. She fucked her way onto the council like the great whore she always was. Bartholomew and Marius are a different story, especially Marius, for he was old when the world was young. You cannot hope to defeat him. Tell me, Babette, I asked. What do you know of Marius? I sat on a nearby rock, intrigued, now despite myself. Babette followed suit, sitting close by. There have been many rumors surrounding Marius, and I have heard many stories throughout the long years. It is claimed by some that he is the oldest of our kind and father to us all. He has sat on the Vampire Council for as long as anyone can remember. It is as if he has always been here, amongst us. You said the oldest father to us all. Do you mean he is the first, the origin of our kind? A look of annoyance passed across her smooth features at my interruption. Bartholomew certainly seems to think so, she continued. He told me a story once. A story he claims came from Marius himself, but he is a great liar, as are we all. But you tell it anyway, I asked. You want to sit here with all of vampire kind baying for your blood and listen to fairy tales. If there's any truth to this story, it may be of some help in defeating our enemy, and that is worth something at least. She nodded to this, before smoothing down her dress and continuing on with her story. Okay, she sighed. This is what Bartholomew told me all those long nights ago. Many years ago, before the Romans came to the land of Britanni, Marius was the son of a great war chief. Not the first son of a position that would have given him great power, but the fourth son, and far from the apple of his father's eye. He was weak and sickly compared to his ferocious brothers. He had no interest in swordplay, hunting, or bloodletting. He was a dreamer who spent most hours gazing up at the stars and preferring the company of his mother over that of his loud braggart of a father. Now it is said that Marius' village had fallen upon hard times. For five years, the crops had failed. In disease and pestilence, roamed the land, and the druid priests believed the old god who lived in the earth had abandoned its people. Sacrifices had been made. Every year, the blood of men, virgins, and even babes had been offered up to the old god of the grove. But the crops still failed, and Marius's people were close to the edge. And so it was on the eve of the winter solstice that the high priest had come before Marius' father and demanded royal blood to sate the hungry god. Marius' father feared the old god greatly, and with only token resistance, had offered up his youngest son under much protest from his screaming mother. Marius, however, did not protest. For him, this was a noble sacrifice 
something he would be remembered for, and a way to help his people, and so he bravely agreed to be sacrificed upon the old one in the ground. The next day, there had been a great feast in Marius' honor. One of the few remaining goats had been bled, and Marius had been given the best of everything, the best food, wine, and women had all been his for the day. It was only as the sun began to set that the revelry settled down and the priests had come with flaming torches held aloft to take Marius to the sacred grove. The walk had been a long one through the night-darkened forest. Marius began to sober with every step. His fear wormed its way into his guts. By the time they arrived at the grove, he was now fully conscious and in a state of abject terror. Now, the high priest had said, Come forward, and pointing towards a small crack in the rock face, you must go there. Inside is a tunnel leading down to where the old god resides. At the bottom you will find an ancient dagger. You must draw your blood to summon the old one, and before you know it, you will be in paradise forever. Easy to speak of paradise when you are not the one on the altar, isn't it? Marius huffed. The priest said nothing to this, but offered him a flaming torch. It is dark inside, and you will need this. Marius took the offered torch and turned away, heading towards his destiny. The inside of the cave was narrow, with stone steps leading down into the winding darkness. The walls were rough, hewn, and heavy with chisel marks as Marius descended. The walls smoothed out revealing hideous cave paintings that seemed to writhe and undulate in the flickering torchlight. Marius quickly looked away. The images burned in his brain, a story of ages past and sacrifices made in blood to one who was old when the stars were still young. But not once did Marius consider fleeing. He had this duty to perform and was honor-bound to see it through. Deeper and deeper he descended, beginning to fear his guttering torch would go out, leaving him alone in the darkness when suddenly the stairs beneath him stopped, grinding him to a halt. He looked in terror at the cavern before him. The cavern was small but with a high ceiling from which dripping stalactites hung like jagged teeth. The walls were covered with a strange-looking lichen that let out a sickening green glow, illuminating the cavern floor that was covered with age-old blackened bones. Protruding from the pile of ancient decay was a large well cut of rough-hewn stone, darkened and stained with the spilled lives of countless victims. Upon the edge of this ancient monastery lay an equally-looking ancient dagger, and as Marius approached, he noted it was not made from iron but from white pitted bone. Reaching down with a shaky hand, he scooped the thing up. It felt incredibly heavy and cold in his hand. This was the gateway. This was how to summon the old god that dwelled, sleeping within the earth. Casting his torch aside, wishing only to get this thing finished, he dragged the blade across the palm of his hand. He hissed in pain as he raised his hand and let his blood fall into the black depths of the ancient well. For a moment, there was nothing. But then the very earth beneath his feet began to shake, and he cried out, falling amongst the ancient bones. Something was coming, racing towards him. He could feel it now, sense its eagerness and terrible greed. From the well came an explosion of foul-smelling water as a giant gray worm suddenly burst forth. Hundreds of crimson eyes burned across its segmented sides where it swayed above him like a hooded leech. Marius screamed and tried to scramble away as the creature opened its gaping maw, revealing a throat lined with hook-like teeth. For a moment, he was sure the thing was going to swallow him whole, but instead, it wrapped him up in its many squirming coils and dragged him screaming into the darkness. Marius began to pray until he realized that he was praying to the very creature that was about to kill him, the old god of the grove. I am not going to kill you, a voice whispered into his mind like a clinging fog. You will be my vengeance, a great plague I shall release upon the world, for I am the last of my kind, the infinite made flesh by the prayers of men. 
My fate is now sealed, as their faith in my kind fades throughout the aching centuries, but through you, my son, something of me shall live on. And with the last of my strength, I bequeath unto you the gift of flesh and blood. Darius opened his mouth to scream as the creature's strange flesh began to fill his body, surging down his throat, invading his bleeding ears, enveloping his brain, filling every crevice with its vile, squirming flesh. And even in his delirium of pain, he could sense the creature's strange satisfaction and a desire he could not possibly comprehend. This torture seemed to last for an eternity, and Marius wished himself dead a thousand times as the creature took from him over and over again, before giving something of itself back. At last, after what seemed to Marius a thousand years, the creature's cruel hooks were withdrawn, and he was gently deposited back onto the chamber floor. For a moment, the creature swayed above him. The light in its many eyes began to fade as it shuddered and trembled. With a bellowing roar, it collapsed beside him, white patches forming over its loathsome hide. The last thing Marius saw before the darkness dragged him under was the loathsome body crumble into dust. My god, I said, climbing to my feet. Do you believe it to be true that Marius is the first of us? She shrugged. I can only tell you what Bartholomew told me, although he is a great liar, as are we all. But if it's true, I said, taking her hand, then what do we do? Running would seem the obvious choice, hiding until this all blows over. I laughed then. You think this will all blow over? Sure. She grinned back at me. In about a thousand years, but until then, I have arranged transport for us out of this country. Where? How? I had my man book us aboard a ship. A cruise liner, to be precise, headed for England. England. I raised a cynical eyebrow. What's in England? Rain, mostly. She replied. That and a rather large estate I came into some years ago. It is secluded deep in the heart of the country. We can buy a little time there until we figure this thing out. The ship leaves from Boston in three days on its return journey to Southampton. Great, I replied. A week stuck in a box in the cargo hold. She chuckled at this. I have booked us first class in a rather expensive suite. Like I said... My man has made all the arrangements. We board in the evening, 9 p.m. to be precise. The company has also been told that we are a wealthy brother and sister suffering from a severe solar aldicaria and are heading for England to try our newly developed treatment. The cruise liner company were very helpful. She laughed again. They even shuttered and painted the cabin windows for us. I laughed then and took her into my arms. Is there anything you didn't think of? Sure, she said, her smile wilting. How to save your life. Six nights later, I stood on the deck of the Ocean Princess. The cold waters of the Atlantic glistening past below. The cold wind biting at my skin. Behind me, a band played and people laughed and drank a hearty assortment of fruity cocktails and yeast-smelling beers. I myself was in no mood for laughter. This was only the third night of our journey, and already Babette and I had a falling out. It all started when she wanted to feed on one of the passengers, a particularly good-looking young man that had taken her eye. I, of course, had voiced a strong objection, but she had rounded on me telling me that not all vampires share my moral compass, and she was free to do as she pleased. Eventually, I managed to convince her. Very well, she had hissed. Looks like the ship will be blessed free of rats. She stormed out then. The boy had lived to see another day, 
but an old man had died not more than a few cabins down from us that very same night. The official verdict was one of heart failure, but I knew better. We had not spoken since. Nicholas. Her voice now floated behind me as she placed a gentle hand on my shoulder. Let us stop this needless bickering. You have your ways. I have mine. Tell me, have you fed tonight? Yes, I answered. As a matter of fact, I have. A young woman. On deck two. She tasted vaguely of peppermint. Nicholas! She exclaimed, shocked. Not to worry, I laughed at her. It was only the smallest of sips, just enough to get by. Did you know there's not a single rat aboard this ship? This modern world is a marvel of sanitation. I wonder, she said. A small smile playing across her bow-shaped mouth. Could the great Nicholas Raddick's moral compass be slipping? I shrugged. Needs met. There really aren't any rats. I looked long and hard. Besides, the girl will come to no real harm. A good night's sleep and she will be fine. She smiled up at me, linking my arm. Come, I have a gift for you, too, in fact. Taking me by the hand, she led us back to our lavish cabin before locking the door and sitting beside me on the bed. You're strong, Nicholas. Almost an elder yourself, but you're not strong enough for what's to come. I, however, would make you stronger still. I stood quickly. What are you thinking, Babad? You already know the answer, she said, gliding towards me. You must drink from me. Accept my sacrament. Drink my blood and you will know power like you have never known before. But at what cost, Babat? What will I lose in return? What little humanity I have left? Oh, Nicholas, she smiled, gently stroking my face. That part of you that glows so bright attracts me like a moth to flame. Your very presence warms my cold soul and gives me comfort. I love you, Nicholas. I would never seek to destroy the things that make you, you. Now come, she said, letting her dress drop to the floor. Come and partake of my goodness. I looked at her ripe body, feeling the old lust for her return, a lust that burned me up from the inside, a lust she would kill for, sell your very soul for. You said two gifts, I said a little breathlessly. Yes, she replied, gliding towards me. The first is my blood. The other is me. I awoke to the sounds of screams. Babette's blood still wet on my lips, my body sore from our lovemaking. Babette was in the doorway. Something had a hold on her. Something huge, covered in fur with claw-tipped membranous wings that raked at her naked flesh. Help me, Nicholas, she cried, trying to stave off the thing's gnawing jaws. With a cry, I leapt from my bed, but it was too late. With a final cry of effort, Babette grabbed the creature's jaw and ripped it free before ramming spear-tipped claws into its fur-covered chest and tearing out its blackened heart. It shrieked an ear-piercing scream that collapsed in a smoking heap upon the floor. What in God's name is that, I said, looking down at the fallen monstrosity. One of the forsaken, she answered, throwing on her clothes, her wounds already begin to heal. Forsaken, I said, not suddenly aware of the smell of burning in the air and the sound of distant screams. Wake up, Babette said, slapping me across the face hard. Sounds like they're all over the ship. Marius must have wanted you badly to release such monstrosities. But how did he find us so soon? I don't know, and right now I don't care. The ship is going down. Marius will leave no witnesses behind. Every man, woman, and child above this ship is dead. We have to get to life rafts and abandon ship before more of these things find us. Come, she said. Let us get above deck and get out of here. As we entered the hallway, a woman came screaming past, a bloody bundle in her arms. Hot on her heels was one of the bat-like monstrosities. It saw us and veered off, coming straight for us. Babette quickly stepped aside. This one is yours, Lord Raddock. Time to use the strength I've gifted you. 
There was no time to protest. The thing was almost upon us, hell-bent on its destruction. Ducking low, I avoided its first clumsy swing, and coming up behind it, slammed it hard into the wall before wrapping my arms around its neck, meaning to drag it backwards, but instead, I tore its head completely free, drowning myself in its vile blood. Very good, Nicholas, Babette said, looking into my stunned face. Your new powers will take a little getting used to, but it's a good start. Now, let's get moving before we end up swimming to England. In no time at all, we were back on deck, taking in the devastation all around us. Everywhere, there were dead bodies reduced to quivering hunks of flesh. Torn metal and shattered glass lay all about. Some few survivors ran here and there, shocked and panic-stricken, but they were easily picked off by the bat-like horrors Babette had called the Forsaken. Uh, ah, there you are, a dark voice crawled out of the shadows. It was Bartholomew leaning casually against the ship's railing, seeming to enjoy the slaughter all about him. When Babette stepped out from behind me, his eyes widened somewhat before his casual demeanor was slimmed back into place. Lady Babette, we should have known you would come to save your... little pet. Pet, she said, looking around at the devastation. I would say it was you who has let your pets off the leash. He bristled at this. These abominations are nothing to do with me. These are Marius's creatures, not mine. We use them to track you, Nicholas, just like a sort of psychic hound dog. It took them some time, but now here we are. And what about these people? I demanded. He shrugged. They were hungry, so I fed them, he said with an evil grin. When they are finished and you are dead, we'll sink the ship and fly back home. Another ship, sadly, lost at sea. Tell me, Babette, have you learned the power of flight yet? That's where I knew his whole casual facade was a lie. He was nervous of her power, and I wondered who was the strongest of the two, and if Babette shared her blood with me. How did it weaken her at all? I learned to fly many years ago, Bartholomew, although I prefer a plane when I can manage it, so tell me. She said, circling him. What now? Now, he said, never taking his eyes off her. Your protege dies for the murder of Jeanette. The only question is if you're willing to join him. Do you not hope to stand against myself and the Forsaken? Uh, stand aside. I promise to make it quick and painless. Oppose me, and you shall both suffer a thousand deaths before the sun rises. You know me, Babette. He said, looking her up and down slowly. You know what I can do. How many times have I tasted your sweet flesh? How many times have I flogged it and sliced it? How many times have you licked your own blood from my skin? You talk of pets, but there was one time you were mine. Mine and Marius's. Such fun we had together. Perhaps I can persuade Marius to give you back to me now that we have lost our precious Jeanette. <laughs> well then, she laughed, you make it a simple choice. I will never be at your mercy again. Kill him and be done with it. The whole thing is beginning to bore me and the night grows short. Do not try to trick me, Babette, Bartholomew growled. I am no fool. There's no trick, Babette said, stepping aside. I won't risk my life for his. He is one of many playthings I have made over these long centuries, and I am sure there will be many others along the way. Just make it quick and painless, as you promised. For a minute, he just stood there, looking at her as if weighing up her words. Okay, he said. I have a better idea. You kill him instead. She sighed deeply. As you will. Sorry, my love, she said, pacing towards me. But you're just not worth it. I tried to back away, but she so suddenly had me by the throat, her razor-sharp nails piercing my flesh. Behind her, Bartholomew began to laugh uproariously. Sorry, he grinned at me, but this is going to hurt somewhat. Suddenly, she spun around and flung me with all of her might at the laughing Bartholomew, who I crashed into with bone-breaking force, smashing the steel railing behind us, sending us both hurtling into the frozen sea. I was falling now, falling through the inky black darkness. Above me was some kind of... Maelstrom, 
It, it took my vampire eyes a moment to adjust to what I really was seeing, but above me, Babette and Bartholomew were locked in a deadly embrace, each tearing at one another with fang and claw, the water around them turning crimson as each fought to best the other. Feeling my bones beginning to heal and re-knit, I swam upwards, kicking, grabbing hold of Bartholomew's leg, but he brought his other foot down upon my head, trying to kick me away. Still, I grabbed at him, clawing my way up his back as Babette hammered at him, trying to free herself from his deadly embrace. When I reached his neck, I threw my hands around it and leaned back my knee against him as I tried to tear his head free. I felt bones groan and tendons snap, but even with Babette's blood, I simply did not have the power. Out of sheer desperation, I tore into his throat, locking onto him. I felt the vibration of his scream as Babette did the same, pinning his arms to his side, the other arm flailing at me, but he was growing weak now and I managed to catch it up and pin it between us. Suddenly we were heading downward at incredible speeds and I tried not to cry out as pressure built until I was sure it would crush my skull, sending my brain squirting from my ears. Yet still we went deeper, Babette driving us downward as I looked on in horror as she tore Bartholomew's arms away and then his leg before rudely pushing him aside. We hit the ocean floor. There she continued her grisly work, pulling his other arm and leg away like some callous child tearing a butterfly's wings. I thought she would surely finish him then, but she did not. Instead, she thrust the body downward onto the sea floor over and over again, ramming it through the earth, burying it in silt, mud, and stone until it was completely gone. Buried under the seaweed-strown wreckage. Taking my hand, we swam upward. Flying through the water at great speeds, Bartholomew's blood was working on me now and I felt stronger, stronger than I had ever felt before. We broke the surface but carried on upward into the air, Babette holding me tight in her embrace. Below us, the ocean liner burned, overwhelmed with flames. All those people, I whispered into her ear, are dead because of me. No, she said, turning us away from the scene. It was the council who brought such wrath upon them. They are no longer fit to serve. I said nothing to this. I was tired. More tired than I had ever been in my long, long life. The sound of the ocean was soothing and Babette's embrace a comfort. I must have fallen asleep, for the next thing I knew we were back on dry land, where I was dumped unceremoniously onto the ground. Glad you enjoyed your nap, Nicholas. But the sun is beginning to rise and we need to find shelter. Where are we? I asked, looking around at what seemed like endless green fields. Cornwall would be my best guess, she replied. You don't know? No, Nicholas. Escaping a blazing inferno while being chased by mutant vampire bats, while duking it out with a master vampire in the depths of the ocean takes it out on a person. We are lucky I managed to make it to landfall at all. Now stop asking stupid questions and get up. We have to find a place to spend the day. Come, she said, marching away. There must be something around here. The something ended up being uh, an old crumbling barn where we buried ourselves in a moldy, wet haystack. Can I ask you something? I said, feeling my body become numb as the sun broached the horizon. Why did you not kill Bartholomew? Why just bury him, hide him away like that? Leverage, she yawned. Marius will want his little plaything back. Plaything? I whispered, feeling the life drain from my body as the sun spilled across the land. Yes, Babette breathed. You have much to learn, my love, so, so much to learn. But her words trailed away as the darkness sucked us under. I was dreaming. I was floating in a great lake of blood, a hand clasped mine, and I turned, smiling, expecting to see my daughter, Isabel, floating beside me, but instead I stared into the grinning face of Marius. I will find you, Nicholas Raddick, keeper of the family. I will find you, and when I do, he smiled, 
revealing a split tongue that squirmed in the jagged cavern of his mouth. When I do, I will tear out your fucking soul. Suddenly, his hand shot out from under me, dragging me down. There were hundreds of them, thousands, all in chains, their eyes gouged out, their throats torn open, and I, I realized to my horror that this was all that was left of my family. Generation after generation of my descendants, tortured and condemned to this hell. My hair was suddenly seized, and my head broke the surface. For the family... Marius whispered into my ears, and suddenly the lake of blood became a lake of fire. I began to scream as the flames took hold. I screamed long and loud. In the end, I screamed loud enough to wake the dead. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video, or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. It really helps me out whenever you guys do things like listen, or watch. And it really helps if you guys also subscribe to the podcast, or subscribe to the YouTube channel, or do things like clicking the bell, or clicking the like button. Also, it's becoming allergy season, <laughs> and it's affecting me, in case you couldn't tell. Well, I have one thing that actually does help me out, and that's the help from my wife's tea. My wife makes tea and sells it online at etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. If you guys want to test some for yourself, then head over to the shop, get yourself some of the Dark and Stormy Night, which is my personal favorite, and ask for the Dabbing Mr. Creepy Pasta sticker. And as always, I want to give a very special thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon. You guys are the ones who help me keep the lights on the house, as well as allow me to do things like commission brand new stories. In case you guys haven't noticed, we hit that tier. So a very special thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stricken, Chase Burnett, Deanna Krauss, G Weevil 3, Tristan Pelton, 1-800-Nightmare, Acid System, Aaron Stormcrow, Azarine Fox, Bobby Carmen, Chris Lovin, Cryptic Nightmares, The Doctor, Daniel Polson, Dr. Stein and Mr. Happy, Euro Gore, Freddy Krueger, Fried Chicken 12, Hades Nephew, Infertile One, James Bruce, James Lowe, Jason V.R. Wilson, Jimbo the Hutt, Jordan Nels, Jordan Johnson, Caleb Dougal, Kiri the Sloth, Legit Quad Feed, Liam Newman, Lisa Cottrell, Marco Takes Dabs 420, Michael Scarborough, Nico Kyle, Nina Smith, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Rafael Rodriguez, Robert White, S Man, Sky Harbor, Snails Burnett, Talon Carlick, The Ginger Bros, Trace Miles, Suji Campbell, Tynany, Unknown Nobody, Andre Garcia, Brianna Wright, Brian Ace, Caspian Hogunkji, and Someone You Love. And also a very special thank you to everybody who's down there in the description down below. Oh, all you guys who are listed as patrons and everybody who's even supporting for just one dollar i really love and appreciate you guys and if you want to join them you can always head over to patreon.com slash mr creepypasta even a dollar a month honestly it keeps the show going so thank you guys so much and to everyone out there sweet dreams